Okay, so next I would like to introduce Amanda Vicinanzo. I promised her that I would get it right. Uh, she is the Public Information Officer for the Stafford County Sheriff's Office, the former managing editor for the magazine Homeland Security Today. It has experience in cybersecurity and security topics, extensive information background there, and will be talking to us about working effectively with law enforcement to combat domestic violence. So, thank you, ma'am. Hi everyone. As Chris mentioned, my name is Amanda Vicinanzo and I am the Public Information Officer for the Stafford County Sheriff's Office in Virginia. Uh, previously, I worked for Homeland Security Today magazine. Um, I covered a wide range of topics ranging from cybersecurity to um, aviation security, critical infrastructure protection, um, anything really security related. And um, I also have some experience um, working for a local newspaper, and um, I'm a graduate of the National Journalism Center in Washington, D.C. I also have my master's degree in statecraft and national security affairs. I received that from the Institute of World Politics. And um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, working so closely with law enforcement has been a tremendously eye-opening experience for me. I grew up around law enforcement. My dad was a cop and later a detective. And um, at one point, he decided to go to law school. And um, I ended up working for him in his firm. He um, really helped me to gain an introductory knowledge to the criminal justice system. And through that experience, I saw some of the good things and I saw some of the bad things. And now, working in law enforcement in my current role, um, I'm beginning to understand in a way I never did before some of the challenges that law enforcement face on a daily basis. And on the flip side, especially when it comes to domestic violence, some of the challenges and obstacles that are facing victims and then survivors of um, domestic violence and abuse as well. And so my goal today is to share with you ways that you can effectively work with law enforcement um, to convey relevant security information to victims to better serve them. So one of the things we'll talk about is some of the challenges that law enforcement face. And then we'll also talk about some of those challenges that victims face. And then I wanna end by um, talking about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and I think is also probably the most important thing we will talk about today in the next hour and that is education and awareness. Um, effective messaging and communication is probably the most important thing you can do to change lives and to make sure the victims are aware of the information and resources that are available to them. And so I wanna start right now with talking about um, some of the challenges that law enforcement face when responding to domestic violence incidents. So I think every day when we wake up, we face a great deal of unknowns. The day could hold anything. We could get into a fender bender on their way to work. We could receive a call from a family member letting us know that they have a major illness like cancer. Or we could go through our day and it could just be a regular day. But for law enforcement officers, that unknown is so much greater every day. Every morning they wake up, they put on their uniform, they put on that heavy ballistic vest, they wrap their duty belt around their waist, they kiss their loved ones goodbye, and then they brace themselves for the unknown. And, you know, it could end up being just a regular day, or they could be called to put their lives on the line. And nowhere is that more true than when a call for a domestic disturbance comes over the radio? They know in that circumstance that they might be called to put their lives on the line and that there's victims in great danger. And so um, I have a few facts here. Um, just in the first few months of 2018 alone, six officers were killed in domestic-related shootings. 
And um, domestic calls also lead to about 14% of officer deaths every year, according to the FBI. And um, I want to share a story with you. The title of this slide, New Virginia Officer Killed on a Domestic Violence Call, was the headline of a New York Times article that was published online on February 28, 2016. And this tragedy took place in the jurisdiction just north of me, Prince William County, in 2016. Um, Officer Ashley Gwinden was on her first shift. She was brand new to the job. She and two other officers responded to a call that would normally just be routine. And um, it ended up resulting in her death. And the other two officers were severely wounded. Um, the man responsible, his name was Ronald Hamilton. He was an Army Staff Sergeant. And he and his wife, Crystal Hamilton, had been fighting all day long Saturday. And um, eventually they were, the altercation became physical. And Crystal called 911. And um, before we even responded to the scene, uh, her husband had shot and killed her. And then as soon as the officers responded, he took a gun and shot all three of them. And Ashley Gwinden, on her very first day on the job, sacrificed her life. And um, her sister said something that really resonated with me and is why I'm sharing this story with you today. And she told NBC4 that she hopes her sister's tragic death will start a conversation about the dangers of domestic violence. And I share with this, you, this story today um, just to remind you that the death of Officer Gwinden and tragedies like that, those stories are at the back of the minds of command staff for law enforcement agencies across the nation as they are trying to think of new ideas and implement new strategies and policing approaches to um, handle domestic violence situations. And um, some of these new ideas and strategies include um, partnerships and coalition building. And I really want to emphasize this one because that is probably the most important thing that law enforcement agencies are doing right now. I think we all know that Back in the 70s and 80s, um, law enforcement did not take domestic violence very seriously. It was considered terribly more of a nuisance than it was a crime. And so there's been a lot of reform over the past few years, past few decades. Um, and a huge part of that has been what are called community-based approaches. And so the idea is that law enforcement will work with community leaders as well as um, social services, um, victims advocates, um, shelters and safe houses, um, regular members of the community. And the idea is to get everybody in one room, sitting down at the same table and talking about the issue. And so when law enforcement approach domestic violence, they are looking through it at it through one lens. When prosecutors look at domestic violence, they're looking at it through another lens. When victims are thinking about violent, um, domestic violence, they're looking at it through an entirely other lens. And so when you have everybody come and sit down on the same table and share those ideas, you have all these different shared perspectives. And that is when change is born. That is when we can start empowering victims with information and resources that can change their lives. And throughout the course of this conference, you are going to learn about a lot of safety and security concepts and technologies that will be very useful to victims um, and that can really help to keep them safer. And you're not going to be able to share that information with them without these partnerships and information sharing. Um, sometimes law enforcement think that they play an unimportant role when it comes to domestic violence because it's so limited. But it is important because they're the first point of contact that a victim is going to have 
in a domestic violence situation. So they need to be equipped to better respond to those situations. And while they're very much in the mode of protect, 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 knowing the dangers, knowing they might have to put their lives on the line, knowing that the victim's life is on the line, um, they need to still be in that mentality that you know, they are that first point of contact and they are gonna be that vehicle to connect victims to the resources that they need. And so information sharing um, between all the different players here is very, very important. Um, another thing I want to talk about is um, de-escalation. And I don't know if you're familiar with what that is, but the idea is that it's kind of a, um, an alternative to use of force. And so at the Stafford County Sheriff's Office with, where I work, um, they really emphasize de-escalation in training. And um, it can be very useful in different violent encounters for people to know that police are, th are you know, being trained in this way. And so um, one thing that we've been using um, that we obtained about a year ago was the Viertra 300 training simulator. And it is pretty amazing. It's kind of this, almost like this big virtual reality video game, except it completely immerses you um, in the scenario. And so basically there's 300 degree walls and it offers hundreds of different scenarios. Our officers use the firearms that they would normally use on the street that have been, been um, um, refilled with CO2 cartridges and um, it's just very realistic. The floor vibrates. They have like a little um, mechanism that's attached to them that can tase them if they're shot. Um, but the cool thing is, is that there are hundreds of different scenarios and you can choose different endings for each one. And um, what's been most popular is with school safety um, as kind of a hot topic. We've had dozens of um, different media outlets come down and ask us to show them our scenario on active shooters in schools or active shooters in, in movie theaters. But the one I think is really cool is one where nothing exciting happens. Not a single shot is fired. It's a domestic violence um, scenario where um, the officer sees a man with his arm around the woman's neck and the officer's challenge is basically just to talk him down. And throughout the course of the scenario, not a single shot is fired, not from um, the officer, not from the suspect, and then it ends. And, and that's something that we've really been emphasizing lately to keep violent encounters from getting even worse. So a lot of times victims worry they're gonna, when they call the police that things are just gonna escalate. They're gonna get even worse. So they're afraid to call 911 in the first place thinking, you know, they're fearful and, um, you know, they, they don't know if the police is going to do anything. And it's, and it's worse, like, one, if those fears are confirmed and, um, you know, two, if the situation just gets even worse. And so we've really been emphasizing de-escalation, um, not just for domestic violence, but for other situations. Um, and I do want to share with you um, a story to kind of emphasize, to kind of give you an idea of how it works. So in December of last year, um, I got to see how de-escalation techniques work firsthand. I woke up one morning at like 5.30 a.m. and I get a call that we have a potential suicide by cop situation at the local Walmart. There was a woman who was driving from Florida and she was just in a horrible position. She had $14 left in her bank account. Um, she was struggling with financial and marital and um, family issues and she just at one point decided as she's driving up 95 um, that she's gonna pull in to Stafford County and use her firearm to shoot herself and so she around 530 in the morning she pulls into the parking lot of Walmart 
parks next to a tractor trailer where a driver's sleeping, and she starts drinking and waving around her firearm, and somebody sees and reports it, and uh, when our officers responded to the scene, she's waving around the gun, she's crying, she's frantic, and she tells the officers, please shoot me, please shoot me, and she points her firearm at them, and she says, please shoot me, and um, this went on for hours, and our drone team responded, um, our SWAT team responded, everyone was there, and throughout the course um, of the, those few hours, um, our crisis inter intervention team um, came close up to the vehicle and helped talk her down, and eventually around 10 o'clock that morning, um, they um, were able to get her to come out of her vehicle, put down her firearm, and, um, you know, help her, you know, get help at a mental health facility. And, you know, maybe in a different time or in a different jurisdiction, that wouldn't have happened. Um, traditionally, law enforcement has been taught to exercise the lethal option if somebody shows a firearm or if they think their lives are in danger. But that's not emphasized today. And there are some situations where that might be the only option, but today, um, De-escalation is being emphasized by law enforcement agencies across the nation, and I think it's a good first step. Now on the flip side, we have the victim's relationship with law enforcement. And common obstacles for victims in the early stages of their escape from domestic violence situations deal with perceived fears associated with law enforcement. Um, some examples here are many of victims are afraid to call 911, or even worse, law enforcement gets involved and they do not get the help they need, or law enforcement don't connect them to the resources they need. Um, and I want to share with you a story that can kind of emphasize this perspective. I want to share with you the story of a 19-year-old young woman. The year is 2010, and she's 19 years old. She lives in a suburb of about 25,000. Um, it's mostly upper middle class. Um, most of the workers are in the um, health and technology fields. Um, she came from a very well-respected and well-known family. Her father was a scientist, and her mother was a musician. And in her late teenage years, she started recognizing that some of the experiences she had had as a child were abuse. And unfortunately, um, her mother, who was very religious, used that in a negative way to make her daughter feel that the abuse was her fault. Not only was she molested by her father, she also experienced um, physical violence at the hands of both of her parents. Her mother once hit her so hard that she broke a wooden spoon over her back. And for years, the daughter never mentioned this to anyone, thinking it was her fault. And finally, in 2010, at 19 years old, she left her family home. And she moved not far away to um, the residence of a friend. And what unfolded over the next few years is the stuff of nightmares. She, that night, um, her parents called the police and told them that their daughter was being held hostage. And the police showed up. And she had to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not a child. I'm safe. I just escaped this situation. And the police were kind of like, OK, and left. And um, it didn't end there. She continued to get messages from them. Um, they inundated her email and social media accounts, um, begging her to come home. and. Um, asking her why she would leave. And um, she tried to cut off contact with them, but 
Um, they would show up at the friend's house. Um, their, her mother told their church community and friends that the daughter was in danger because she had just um, joined a satanic cult. And this young woman was not surprised when she heard that story. When her cousin ran away as a 13-year-old, um, she was told that the cousin had also joined a satanic cult. And so it wasn't the first time that somebody had said that, and um, she was just unsurprised. And um, the police continued to get involved over the course of the next year. Um, her parents would, also, would often ask for welfare checks, and the police would show up. And in the beginning, while they didn't exactly believe her, they were understanding. But over the course of a year, they started to get irritated. They started asking her, hey, why aren't you going home? This is a family dispute. We don't want to be involved. You need to reconcile with your family and stop getting us involved. And so they, she just had immense pressure, not just from the family, but from law enforcement to go back to the abusive situation. And I don't need to tell anybody here that that's completely unacceptable and should not have happened. So finally, about a year later, she decides to leave town. And she realizes she cannot live in this community with her parents and have a peaceful existence. And so knowing um, what her parents are capable of, she drives to the police station and she leaves her car there because it was in her mother's name. She had paid for the car herself, but she knew her parents would probably report it as stolen. And the police were kind of baffled. They were like, oh, they're not going to do that. And she was like, yes, they will. And so she had to start completely, like completely from scratch. And um, she didn't know the resources that were available to her at the time. And unfortunately, um, some of the, she, she did get help at a shelter, but they were understaffed. And um, so she didn't know about things like stocking orders or an address confidentiality program or really any of the resources that were available to her until really late in the game. And in the meantime, even after she left town, um, her father eventually found her. And he would play all these weird mind games with her. He'd leave like little things around her house, um, things like uh, a pencil box with a business card in it that she had from middle school. He'd leave that at her door. Or a piece of mail he'd put on top of a trash can, just little things that would keep her on edge. And um, eventually she was able to get a restraining order. And she again changed her residence. And, Eventually, her father lost, um, lost track of her. Today, eight years later, this young woman is living a full and pretty happy life. Um, but unfortunately, you know, life is not going to be the same for her. And for instance, when she graduated from college, she didn't have her name or her picture in her college program. So she had graduated magna cum laude, among other accomplishments, and she couldn't share those with anybody. Um, she also makes sure she keeps a folder with all prior police reports around. And um, just in case her father ever shows up again, she has those handy. And while that's a smart move, it's also, it's also sad that she has to do that and have that constant reminder of her past. Um, she's also made the very difficult decision not to have any children. She's afraid that one day uh, her parents will track down her children if she has them and that they would be in danger. And um, I want to share with you a quote from her. She says, I know that if my parents ever found out that they had a biological grandchild, they would follow me to the ends of the earth to try to get their hands on my children. I will never expose another innocent human being to what I experienced if I can help it. And I will not pass down this legacy of abuse onto another human being. It's unlikely that my brother will have children, so the family line will end with me. Hopefully I can use my life to write a better story for myself and future generations. So my hope is that stories like this will result in better endings a year, five years, 10 years down the road. 
that by forming these partnerships and helping each player involved to look at these situations through a different lens, that we can bring these perpetrators to justice and help victims to become survivors. And to get to that point, um, communication and effective messaging are going to be critical. So in speaking to this woman, I asked her a question. I asked her, what do you wish you had known at the beginning of your journey? And she said she just wishes she had more information. She wishes she had known how to escape. She wishes she had known how to protect her identity. She wishes she had known um, how to protect her location. She just needed more information. And so when you leave the, um, the doors of this building this afternoon, empowered with all these new ideas and safety concepts and security solutions that you are excited to start implementing, you might eventually sit down in your office and think, now what? Uh-oh, how do I do this? How do I get this information to victims? How do I get everything I've learned throughout the course of this conversation to them? How do I effectively communicate? And um, I want to share with you another quote, because I love quotes. <laughs> and this is by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And he said, genius is the ability to put into effect what is on your mind. And that is going to be your challenge when you leave this conference. It's to equip your communities with the information they need before they find themselves in a dangerous situation. There have been many successful social media campaigns designed to educate the public on domestic violence and remind us just how prevalent it is. But we need to take these campaigns a step further. We want people to know that domestic violence is happening a lot. And I think because of these campaigns, people know that. A lot of us are now familiar with the statistics. We know that one in three women and one in four men has suffered physical violence at the hands of an intimate partner. We know that because of these campaigns, but what we don't know is what to do if we find ourselves in that sort of situation. So what we need to be doing at this point is finding ways to effectively educate and mobilize the community to understand how they can protect themselves if they ever find themselves in these types of situations. They need to know what this young girl wish she had known, how to keep her identity safe, how to keep her location safe, how to escape, what to, affect, uh, what to expect when dealing with law enforcement and more. And this is why effective messaging is going to be so important. I don't know how many of you in the room today are play a part in or maybe even lead your organization's um, social media or communications efforts, um, but it doesn't matter because everyone in this room, I will guess, has one of these. And anyone in their sm with a smartphone in their hand has the ability to share information that could save a life and empower victims. And so, the key is to spread information on how victims can recognize and protect their vulnerabilities. Education is important in helping protect sensitive information. We all know abusers can easily access open source information on a person. Things like property ownership, real estate transactions, births and marriages, that's just to name a few. Um, all are easily accessible in the public domain. Just look at the case of the young woman um, that I just shared with you. She learned what proactive measures she needed to, um, to take to stay safe. Um, but rather than letting victims learn the hard way, while they are enduring probably the most harrowing situation they ever had in their life, wouldn't it be better if they already knew what to do? 
So I want to talk about a few important components of effective messaging and communication that will hopefully help you when you go back to your organizations and offices after this, con after this conference um, th so that you can implement these and maybe help share that information. So the first thing to keep in mind is if you haven't thought about who your audience is, there is a good chance you aren't communicating at all. And this is closely linked with tip number two, communicate with your community the way you want to be communicated with. So I have a sister and she is 17 years old and I was talking to her the other day and I asked her, hey, do you have a Facebook account? And she said, no. She said, Facebook is for old people. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and it was sort of a powerful moment for me though because uh, I am in charge of the social media efforts and public information uh, for my agency. And we primarily just used Facebook and Twitter to communicate. And I realized that we were missing a huge segment of our population and community because we weren't using other social media platforms. So that kind of forced me into starting an Instagram account and starting to look at new platforms so I could reach a wider audience. And um, when you're thinking about communicating with your community the way they want to be communicated with, you kind of have to get outside of yourself a little bit and think about what everybody else is doing. So what social media platforms are they using? And it's so easy to be like, oh, I don't know how to do that, or I don't want to do that, that's not my thing. But the way to convey information is to you know, use the platforms that they're using. Um, the same thing when it comes to messaging. Um, you might have general messaging that you'll share that will be applicable to everybody, but you also want to be thinking about it in smaller groups. So when it comes to domestic violence and abuse, that's something everyone should know about. We know that those statistics I just talked about are applicable to everybody. We know domestic violence and abuse is happening to somebody that we know, and they're not talking about it. So we need to be thinking about how to target certain groups. We need to be thinking about what's our message going to be for the 17-year-old? What's our message going to be for the 35-year-old? What's our message going to be like for men who are experiencing this? And so we need to be thinking about all of those things if we want to effectively communicate and make sure that our important messages are reaching the people we hope that they're going to reach. And so the third tip here is sometimes you can't change the narrative, but you can participate in the conversation. And so the idea here is, you know, we're going to leave here with all these new ideas, all these new solutions, and maybe those will not be at the forefront right away. Maybe not everybody is going to be talking about them, but we can find ways to participate in the conversation. So we can find ways, like whether we're you know, just talking with one another or whether it's on social media, to really engage. And so in the past, people used to just talk about return on investment. And there's a whole new term we're using now with social media called return on engagement. And so the idea, which leads into the fourth point, is that social media is about community building, not just one-way communication. And I think so much of the us do that, I know I do, where you're just kind of using social media as like a one-way mechanism to share inf information that you might find useful or you know, that's pertinent to your organization. But you're not starting a conversation. And so I know like Facebook has really um, asked us as law enforcement agencies to do better by engaging with our communities. They're saying, hey, people really like it when you actually answer the comments. And it kind of pays off for us too because you know, we, you get a lot of trolls, but you also get a lot of people who are like, hey, thumbs up. And if you comment on the positive comments, that automatically puts that comment first. So if you ignore the trolls, comment on the positive comments, those are what's gonna show up. Those are what people are gonna see when they're looking at you know, your Facebook page or your Twitter page. And you know, so that's, that can be huge. 
Um, if you get direct messages, respond to them. You know, I know sometimes being in law enforcement, you know, we want people to call our non-emergency number or, you know, during an emergency to call 911. We're not really hoping people will use the direct message function on Facebook to tell us about emergencies or, you know, whatever it may be. But they're communicating with us and that's awesome. So we need to be, that's, that's how they want to communicate. So we need to reciprocate and we need to build our community. And, um, you know, social media today, you know, it has a dark side, it has that negative side, especially for victims of, you know, domestic violence and abuse. They're always, you know, trying to find ways to, you know, either withdraw from social media or use a fake account because it can be a way for their abuser to find information about them. But it can also be a really positive thing. And so in this situation, an abuser is often in a position of power and control. And they're using social media, you know, to meet their needs, to gain information on the victim. We need to take that power back. And one of the ways we can do that is through effective messaging. And finally, the fifth point here is the medium is the message. And so the idea here is to think about not only what your message is, but who is conveying that message. Um, so sometimes the best person to convey your message might be the head of the organization. Um, they're in a position of authority, you know, a leader in the community. Sometimes they're the right person to share that message. But maybe the real authority on a subject, and especially um, you know, when it comes to the topic we're talking about here today, would be a domestic abuse survivor. Um, so you need to be thinking about who the best person is to convey that message and not immediately just going to the person in charge. Yes. Yeah. Basically about how the abuser utilizes, you know, social media uh, to uh, to obtain and maintain power over the victim. What is the um, and I know that you can't maybe specifically speak to DC because you're in Virginia, but what are what do you all um, and law enforcement, how are they encouraged to intervene when controlling uh, behaviors are reciprocal. So the victim, so with the population that I work with, um, a lot of times, you know, the victim is also doing controlling behaviors. So going through the phones, trying to do whatever, right? It's just a, a negative and hostile dynamic between in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So how do you all intervene when there's no um, victim perpetrator to be able to again um, convey these messages that empower people to um, at least adhere to the law and respect like boundaries. Yeah. So the um, yeah. So your question then is what what interventions is law enforcement taking, or how are they addressing? Um, relationships where there's not a very clear perpetrator victim dynamic. Yeah, so basically what are law enforcement um, officers doing in these situations where it's not clear who the victim is and who the perpetrator is? Yeah. Yes, that is a very, 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 very common problem that law enforcement officers have when they're responding to these situations it's always very difficult to determine who the victim is and who the perpetrator is in these situations. And um, one of the things um, that we've tried to implement is just better training. Um, but a lot of times we're not gonna know until sometime in the beginning, in, in the middle of the investigative process. Because in the beginning it's very he said, she said, and so it's not until we really, um, you know, are kind of going through the case that we're kind of getting a sense of 
okay, you know, this is or this is not. Um, but really, it just comes down to training. Um, the law enforcement officers are trained in different techniques to like to 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 know that. Um, and unfortunately, I'm sure that sometimes they get it wrong because it's not, like you said, it's it's not clear cut. It's not always black and white. Um, you know, sometimes the victim has done some behaviors that might not be correct, but that obviously does not mean that whatever the suspect did, you know, was in any way acceptable. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a huge gray area that's really difficult to address. Sorry, follow-up question. Yes. Uh, so then how, how does that sort of, and then what is the message in that case when you are speaking and reaching out to the community that, you know, is filled with victims and abusers or perpetrators? So like, how does that influence your messaging? Okay. Um, so the question is, um, how is our messaging impact by not having a clear understanding of who the victim is and who the abuser is? So from a law enforcement perspective, um, our messaging when it comes to these situations, well, first of all, we don't usually release um, like news releases, press releases, or really any information when it comes to um, a domestic violence incident. Um, very, very rarely will we ever do that because it is um, so sensitive and we really do want to have that time to be able to, you know, kind of, you know, figure out the whole story. Um, and so I know the policy at the Stafford Sheriff's Office is we don't write news releases about domestic, domestic incidents unless maybe, you know, there was like a major shooting, like the Ann Vashley Winden case, something like that we would. Um, but secondly, you know, if we were to do that, if we were to write a release, it would be um, really limited to the facts that were contained in the police report. So it would be filled with a lot of police jargon and would probably start with, you know, on September 18th, 2000, uh, on September 18th, 2018 at approximately 5 p.m., Deputy um, Reed responded to such and such residents and came into contact with these two people. And it's just very factual and a lot of the, um, a lot of the details are left out. So what's being communicated to the public is usually just is very limited. And that's because in these situations, we, we don't want to violate the victim's privacy. All right. Oh, of course. Sure. Um, so that question was, um, do we do primary or predominant aggressor in responding to domestic violence calls? I actually don't know that. Yeah, I'm not sure the answer to that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the question is, how are we addressing these situations where there seems to be an uptick in maybe female aggressors? Um, and sort of how are we as an agency and how are other jurisdictions kind of coming together to establish a standard for how we're responding to these situations? Um, unfortunately, right now, I think that it's a kind of a siloed approach. Um, every jurisdiction has their own 
different policies when I come when it comes to this. Um, but I do know there has been a push in recent years to change policy and procedure um, so that there is less things like, you know, victim blaming or re-victimization in the process. And I know that, um, especially at, at the sheriff's office, they've tried to pull in, we have like our victim, you know, witness protection program. We have um, Empower House, a local um, shelter that we work with. And um, we've tried to like kind of really come together and figure out what are the issues that our community is seeing that victims are, you know, having when they're working with law enforcement. Um, but that is really just, you know, our one agency. Um, so I think that kind of goes back to the importance of that, you know, partnerships and coalition building though, because, you know, you, you know, see those things and have these experience with these victims and law enforcement needs to hear that. And in the past, I think um, there wasn't as much collaboration. And so law enforcement was looking at it with a very insular view. And now that people are starting to come and sit down at the same table together and share these ideas, um, again, that's where change is born. Um, so, um, I mean, I really challenge anybody here who's not in law enforcement to, you know, hopefully law, you know, the law enforcement agency, you know, in your jurisdiction is, um, is receptive, but really working with them and trying to open their eyes to what's going on. And if they're not responsive, some of these bigger movements will help because one of the big reasons why it's not like the 70s and 80s anymore when, you know, um, domestic violence is just being treated as, you know, a nuisance is because, because of these big campaigns, because of this huge national push to understand that domestic violence is, a, is an issue and it is a crime. And so if you're not having any luck at the local level or even at the state level, um, you know, that's where education and awareness is going to come in, into, a, into play. Um, you know, that's where we need to be coming together and say, hey, they're not on the same page as us right now, but they absolutely need to be. So need, we need to be thinking bigger. We need to go big or go home. We need to come up with these, you know, campaigns that are going to change the way that we approach domestic violence and abuse. So if the law enforcement agencies that you, anyone is working with are not receptive, you know, they might be dealing with some of the challenges we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. They might be thinking just in a totally different mindset, um, but they shouldn't be. And so if we really start using the you know, effective messaging and reaching a wide audience through different education and awareness campaigns, I think we can start to change that mentality. So I hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> And so I've actually have reached the end. Um, I know we've talked about a lot today, um, but I just, if there is just one thing you take away from this presentation and forget everything else, um, I just want you to remember um, that education and awareness is everything. This is not an area where you want to scrimp or give the least amount of energy. This is where you are going to change lives. We, we've been talking about that for the last, you know, 15 minutes or so, and I think this is really where it's at. You know, this is really how we're gonna change the game. And so, when you go back to your offices at the end of this conference, with empowered with all these new ideas, um, I hope you just keep that in mind and um, don't feel limited. Um, I know it can be so hard, there's so much red tape, or maybe you're not involved in some of the social media communications efforts in your agency, but really it can start, look how quickly something can go viral. You know, just sharing a video or a post, something powerful like that. Um, each and every one of us in the room can do that. And so just have this, that in mind. Um, I know like the daily grind can be hard and it can be difficult when you feel like somebody isn't listening. But with an issue as important like this, we can make them listen. So just keep in mind that education awareness is gonna be so important and don't lose hope. <laughs> Um, any questions? 
I'd like to testing testing. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, this might make it easier for other questions as well to have this, so you don't have to repeat every question. But for those in the room or those uh, watching that are able to control their own messaging, so particularly the very small shelters or safe houses, uh, those that are somehow involved in creating and crafting messages through social media, um, what messages, how, how can they? effectively spread that message in addition to the tips that you had what sort of things should they be talking about to start to build up those relationships um, so one of the things you want to keep in mind is that for instance Facebook algorithms um, we all know that you know if you start you know looking at a certain type of content you'll kind of get more of that in your newsfeed based on those algorithms but another thing that people aren't always aware of is that it's also looking at the type of content. So are you getting this from, are you looking at more videos than photos? Are you looking at links that send you to another web page? Or are you, um, you know, or are you primarily just looking at messaging, you know, that's on that, you know, on your, in your newsfeed? Um, and so one really important thing to do is whatever the message is, is to make sure that you are um, using a diverse range of content. So don't just post videos, don't just post video um, photos, and don't just post links. Make sure you mix it up and include um, you know, an array of those things, and that way you're targeting a wider audience. You're targeting the girl who likes the links. You're targeting the guy who likes the videos and reaching more people that way. Um, and then as to um, the message itself, um, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind some of those tips and techniques um, that we talked about, um, but also keep it simple and um, really leverage the power of video. Um, today, um, people aren't really reading the post and, um, you know, if you don't have a picture or a video with a post on your social media feed, nobody's really going to look at it. And what's even more um, uh, popular right now and trending is Facebook Live. Um, Facebook Live videos are viewed three times as long as a normal video that's posted. So it's little things like that. Know the trends when you're thinking about your messaging techniques. Know what's popular, know what's trending. Um, I'll never forget <laughs> um, a couple weeks ago, um, there's this popular social media account called Trooper Bob. And I think he's with North Carolina State Police. And he just really knows social media and his audience. And so it, one day he noticed it's trending National Pepperoni Pizza Day. And so he wrote a traffic tip, it kind of incorporating that, something like, I don't even remember, but it, it was just great. So look at what the trends are, look at what's popular, and um, kind of go from there. If that answers your question, perfect. That was, that was fascinating. I really appreciated that messaging. I know that's very relevant to the audience here. We have law enforcement, we have uh, social work, we have uh, other agencies represented. And I think it's very important that we do start building up those partnerships. And I did see some conversations starting to happen yesterday in that regard, which I think is a very positive thing. And I think it's a, uh, it's a new perspective that we can start to look at in that maybe we don't have the username and password to our agency's social media account. But I think every single person raised their hand yesterday and we asked who works for an agency or is affiliated with an agency that has social media. And I think we all do. To some regard, to one regard or another, we all touch social media. And ultimately, I think I speak for all of us, I think we'd all agree on this, is that when it comes to problems facing domestic violence, when it comes to com combating domestic violence, all of us want to put ourselves out of work. 
we ought to put ourselves out of that business by making sure, ultimately, if that was not an issue, a problem, then we'd all be very, very happy with that. Of course, then we could go on and find other jobs or careers. But ultimately, we want domestic violence to stop. And I think that when we can find some other tool that helps us to do that, to any regard, when we can find some other way that we can start to empower victims of domestic violence to escape or to restart their life or to start to build up again by giving them messaging, then I think that's something that we need to embrace. Um, the reality is, is that there are people that are affected by domestic violence, either themselves or someone that they love and care about, that are on social media. We know this. So if we can reach them, we have a message to give to them, and I think it's worth devoting some time for. So I'm very happy with the message that Amanda had for us. I think it's very relevant.